Hello, this is Tyler Crone with the 36th Legislative District. We are so delighted to have Liza Rankin here, who is interviewing with us to continue to serve as Director, District 1 with Seattle Public School Board. Over to you, Liza, to introduce yourself and welcome. Thank you so much and hello to the Thundering 36th. Um, my name is Liza Rankin. I am a born and raised Seattleite with some roots on the East Coast. I'm the mom of two Seattle Public School students. Um, I live in the 46th and I have the endorsement for re-election of my senator and two representatives in the 46th. And I currently serve as the vice president and legislative liaison for the Seattle School Board. Um, I'm running for re-election because this is a really critical time of recovery from the COVID pandemic and um, change and challenge with uh, budget and just general <laughs> general time in our in our city and in our in our country really um so in this time of recovery and challenge there's also opportunity and i know that the board staff students and families need support and we need they need continuity um, and institutional and historical knowledge of where we've been and where we want to go and so i'm running to provide that and also to build on my record of focusing on equitable outcomes for students and providing safe and welcoming schools that value every individual child and staff member um, that the whole community can be proud of. I actually can't see the timer. Did you did you want to continue? I'm sorry, I cut you have about 40 more seconds that you can go. I do? Yes. I've gotten, I've gotten good at talking in two minutes. Um, but we can also put that into the follow-up at the end if you would like. Um, sure, let's do that. Okay, great. We'll start with our first prepared question then. And Jasmine is going to ask our first question this evening. Thank you. As a school board director, name some issues or situations where you feel you can make a difference and share an example from your own life where you've applied specific skills towards an outcome. We're wanting to learn more about your vision, what your strategic approach would be, and what unique strength you would bring to the role. And it's in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I'm going to bring that up again. Thank you. Um, well, I think I'm going to have to use as an example work that I am participating in right now as a school board director, um, specifically where I feel I've made a big difference and brought um, different perspective and knowledge around is um, students with disabilities in Seattle Public Schools. There's been a general really great movement in Seattle and, and even this session in Washington State just talking about students and people with disabilities in our system in a way that hasn't been done before. And when I ran the first time, um, that was really uh, one of my goals was to prioritize uh, elevating the needs and understanding of students with disabilities and helping move the needle on inclusion. Uh, Washington State is, even though the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act, was really born here in 1975, um, it, it then took wing and took off in other places much, much faster and more robustly than it has here in Washington State, including in Seattle Public Schools. And so, um, that's, that's uh, both a value and experience and information that I bring both as a person with disabilities and the mother of students with disabilities um, and uh, into helping folks understand um, what the legal obligations are, how we can do better, how other people do do better. It's not impossible. We can totally, absolutely 100% do this. Um, and, and making sure that we don't just talk about it, but it's actually in policy so that, you know, as people, people move on and change, we have those things embedded into the way that we are holding our values. And so um, that was kind of detailed into one thing, but I would say I also come with an educator background. Um, I've taught at the secondary Thank you. The second question tonight will be asked by Sherry. Over to you, Sherry. Hi. Uh, enrollment in Seattle Public Schools has declined since 2020. What steps would you take to reverse this decline? So I, I, this is a 
there's so many things that go into this question. So enrollment in Seattle Public Schools has declined. Enrollment in private schools has also declined. So we're experiencing this real confluence in our city and really across the country of a decline in birth rate. And in Seattle, um, a crunch on housing and affordability. So we have, um, you know, definitely birth rates impacted, but also just there's there's not a lot of new places for families to move into. And a lot of people in Seattle are just not having kids in around the last um, five years. And it's, that's projected to continue for, for another five years or so. And so this bubble of lower enrollment is going to move through our system. Um, I hope to partner uh, between the board, the superintendent and the city to really um, integrate planning between new housing that may come online with our schools, with construction projects and SPS to make sure that we can be aligned in um, encouraging and being ready to accept any new students and encouraging that they come. I know the superintendent has also talked about launching a uh, enrollment campaign, uh, kind of building excitement, more excitement around Seattle Public Schools. And I'm definitely supportive of that. You know, I really want to bring joy and excitement to our schools um, and to have it have Seattle Public Schools be where people, people's first choice. Um, at the same time, we have to kind of face the fact that we're one of the most childless cities in the country right now. Um, and the, only about 18% of our population is under the age of 20, as opposed to a national average of closer to 28%. So there's some things that, um, you know, I, I wanna do what I can to partner with other officials to encourage growth and encourage affordability and density in our, in our, in our city. Um, but also some of it, we will have to grapple with what to do with fewer students. Thank you so much. The third question this evening will be asked by Ginny. Over to you, Ginny. I'm bad about not muting. Uh, <laughs> what is your vision of a well-resourced school and how do you practice equity and inclusion? Well, my vision of a well-resourced school would start with sufficient resources to provide full access to basic education under state and federal law to each and every child that attends. Um, and, and I will say, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a given, that doesn't always happen. So that would be the very first thing um, that's a kind of non-negotiable. Um, and then from that, I think uh, what's exciting to me about this conversation about uh, around a well-resourced school is the opportunity to talk with community about what, how they define what school is and what's available in their school. And that could be, you know, any range of different enrichments. It could mean, you know, different opportunities and arts. But to, to me, what would define the well-resourced school would be um, focused on what programs and opportunities we want to provide for students. And from the board level, focus less on, well, how many, how many classroom teachers should there be and how many this and how many that that gets into the weeds of operationalizing. I think from the board perspective and the, from the community perspective, what we have to focus on is what we want to demand for all of the kids in our communities and then kind of backwards map to figure out, okay, then what are the resources that we need to be able to provide that for all of our kids? Um, and that would be for me, a well-resourced school. And then equity and inclusion, um, I would say, um, aligned with that, you know, part of a well-resourced school would be centering first on the needs of the most, the most marginalized and the, the most underserved. So any definition of a well, well-resourced school has to take that view of all students, but also every student to ensure that we're building a system that support, that builds from the bottom up, that support goes first to those who need the most and then layers and everything else. Thank you. The last prepared question this evening will be asked from Amanda. Amanda. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on addressing the budget deficit? And if necessary, how would you approach deciding which schools to close? So this is where my kind of designer brain comes in, is that I see a budget deficit as, I mean, it's definitely a challenge and it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's also uh, an opportunity 
to think not just about how do we adjust things more or less, take money away from this and add it to this, but how do we actually do away with some of the things that we've told ourselves are, are not, not, uh, not malleable and realize that they are malleable and really think about how we could do things differently to achieve our goals for students. And when I say design brain, I think of that because I, I, I come from a background of being um, a designer in theater. And you know, you can read a script and come up with the most fantastical vision for what the set is going to look like and realize it costs $500,000 and there's only $20,000 in the budget. And you have to be creative and think about how to still tell that story and get what you want across but spending less money on it. And so, uh, you know, I, I really want us to approach the budget deficit, not just thinking about like, well, well what do we need to cut? What could, we, what could we live without? What we, can we get rid of? Because everything is, we don't have extras, right? Everybody in our system, everything that we have right now is really important. So instead of thinking about how do we cut things and um, uh, kind of approach it from a, like a Hunger Games, <laughs> sort of standpoint, I really want to encourage my fellow board members, remind myself and speak with community about what are ways that we could make shifts to get the same result smarter, better. Where could we address inefficiencies? How could we work together um, within constrained resources to still do what we did? Oh, I didn't get to the second part. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liza. Those are the, that is the end of our prepared questions for this evening. And now we will do follow-ups. And I am, um, after you, Laura Marie, I'm going to put my hand in the queue too, but Laura Marie will ask our, our first follow-up. And oh, sorry, one procedural point is we'll have a minute for the answers to these questions. Okay. So thank you, Liza, and thank you for your work with the school board. We know it has not been an easy few years, so just thank you. <laughs> um, I've been hearing from a lot of concerned parents, and um, what are your thoughts on the option schools? And specifically, will you be voting to close them? I don't think that a vote to close them is even a consideration. Supporting, supporting that idea. So here's what, this actually gives me a little chance to answer the question that I didn't, <laughs> didn't get to in that last question. Um, when we look at what is a well-resourced school and when we look at what we want for all of the kids in our community in thinking about how to get there, I think we need two kind of branches. We need to kind of decide, okay, this is the model or this is the, the, the baseline for a neighborhood elementary school, middle school, high school. And then within that, there's also there's always going to be different needs that um, that either can't be met at a neighborhood school, not as many, or just an opportunity to have a different kind of education or experience provided. I think what we really need to do with option schools is is have them be much more well defined about what the option part is. And then ensure that we build in supports to sustain them based on their goals for what they're providing. Thank you. Amanda, why don't you go next? And then I'll put myself in the queue after you. Yeah. Amanda. I was just going to um, ask if you wanted to continue on uh, about the like approach for deciding which schools to close on a systemic level, like how you how you look at that, what criteria you would apply. So I've already, I mean, I've been digging into a lot of this different thing. I've been looking at. Um, enrollment projections and trends and that's not going to the projections that we have it's not going to play out evenly across the city just like right now student density across the city isn't equally applied there are some especially uh, right around the the Eckstein middle school attendance area and uh, parts of West Seattle are going to have are projected to have the most decline and so that would be something that we would need to look at is, okay, where are our students now? Where are our students going to be, you know, in the future? And then also thinking about, you know, that we aim for our school buildings to last 50 to 75 years. So then we also have to think way in the future. Um, so I would want to evaluate enrollment trends and projections with 
uh, capital projects, which buildings are going to be rebuilt when, um, how are the conditions in different buildings, and then how the, the access and proximity for different neighborhoods to a neighborhood school. Thank you, Liza. I'm going to jump in here and ask you the question that's been weighing on my mind of seeing so many families who have been very committed to public schools leaving in my neighborhood and circle. And I'd love you to expand a little bit more deeply about what the school board is going to do to talk to these families who are leaving the public school system. The answer about kind of uh, the housing crisis, COVID displacement, these are all threads, but I do think that there is a broader trend of, of folks who have been lost to from our public school system. And I'd, I'd love to just explore what you're thinking about on that and, and what kind of engagement there will, could be potentially with families who have left. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that um, board directors have, have asked for, actually, iteratively over the years is for, um, there's, there's a form that you fill out and not everybody does it because they don't know they need to do it when they're making the decision to disenroll. Sometimes it's just that they don't show up for their first two months of school the next year and then the assumption is, okay, they've disenrolled. Um, but for the families that do fill out the disenrollment form, we have finally gotten the district to add some questions about, you know, what, what was the decision for you or what made the decision for you to leave? You know, are you moving? Are you, you know, is it displacement? Is there, is there some other reason? So I, this, and then that actually was just added. So I am really interested in seeing what comes of that, if we can learn more. I think in terms of bringing people back, I am really interested in Superintendent Jones's um, proposal about doing sort of an enrollment campaign. And I love more people about what would, what would have them excited to be back? Because we do want to be the number one choice. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, I want um, I want to kind of go the opposite direction of some of the other things that uh, that we've asked about cuts, but um, but um, you you had mentioned uh, in your intro that you were endorsed by both by um, your state senator and I believe both state representatives. Mm -hmm. of members. Um, how would you work, or how are you um, working, and how do you plan to continue working with the legislature in the future to really address? some of our persistent funding problems in the school. I'm really glad that you asked that. So I have been serving as the board's legislative liaison and um, this past session especially really ratcheted up. Um, you know, I've had a couple, a few years of experience to really get to know more legislators outside of just Seattle, to get to know legislators outside of the 46th better. And um, I, Legislative session this year was brutal and sometimes heartbreaking, but it was also, um, like I said earlier, really exciting to have the level of discussion around special education. It did, though, reveal kind of over and over how much we just need to, as advocates and community members, keep not just advocating, but also educating our legislators. Uh, School funding in general is something a little, that's very, very complex that a lot of them don't understand. And then especially once you get to special education funding. And I've worked with school board directors across the state in coming together, sharing information and supporting each other in um, talking to legislators and providing opportunities for them to learn from us. Thank you, Liza. Is there another follow-up question from our e-board because I want to give you back your 43 seconds um, <laughs> to share you know you, there are many questions that have been asked so why don't we have Sherry will be our last follow-up question and then we'll give you a little bit of time to to round out the um, time that you did not take in the intro over okay. to you Sherry. Um, I, this is regarding um, school shootings <laughs> um, I, there have been one um, that resulted in fatality. And so what, I know there are some things going on. I think one of the um, issues I've heard is uh, the kind of maybe lack or not enough communication with the parents. They seem to not know exactly what is going on and what plans are in place to keep kids safe. 
Um, so what the question is, sorry, what was oh, the, so the question is what what I, I don't know what the board is, what the school board can do to address this. It's such a big, um, you yeah. know, that not one one thing to do it's many things. So and I don't know what role the board has. In, yeah, no, I agree. It's been it's been complicated because there's not one thing. And and in the case of the um, tragedy at Ingram in the fall, you know that happened in school. But gun violence is not a school issue; it's a community issue. So trying to figure out, uh, you know, who who would play what role and how to best get support to families, it it, it was hard. And I think, um, you know, I heard that from Ingram parents that, you know, I would share with like their the friends of Ingram like oh here are all the things that were happening last month and here's this and they kind of said well we didn't know any of that and um and and so I think you know there's there's a few things there's there's um supporting or supporting slash directing the uh well actually I'll say I've already been working actually with a relatively new communications person about setting up some templates about what kind of communication the community expects to get from the district, what they expect to get from the school, and just kind of clarifying how and when what information is shared about violence at schools or any other issue and having it be a little more predictable and reliable than, than wondering, are we going to hear about that? Where did that information go? Doing some loop closing too in the audit committee is something that I've been working on that I want to continue. And Eliza, Eliza, if there's a couple more thoughts that you want to share with us, um, please feel free to do so, and then we'll close the formal part of the interview, and Jeremy will just cover what happens next. So why don't you share with us uh, about 30 seconds to 45 30? seconds of closing. Yeah, I would, I would love to share actually about some work that I'm leading right now that I'm really passionate about. Um, and it's very nerdy and not very exciting for most people, which is our board policy manual. We have just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of policies that have been added to and added to, you know, over decades. And um, in kind of a lack in clarity and commitment to updating and maintaining those policies is what has contributed to confusion around whose role is what and how do we know, you know, who should I ask about this? Who's accountable for that? And so I'm in the middle right now or just beginning it policy manual review to organize the policies in a way that is clear are clear for board members and the community um, about what the policy is actually governing and then also align to a schedule of regular review for some core policies of the board that have to do with the vision and values of community so that those would be regularly coming before the community and updated by the board, whoever the board might be at that time. So that's very much um, relevant and, and easy to participate in. Thank you. This concludes the formal part of our interview this evening with you. And we will hand 